welcome back to our series on the scientific understanding of consciousness. Uh, you have perhaps seen some of the other lectures that we have done already. Now this today is of a very different ilk and persuasion. It summarizes the theory proposed by Giulio Tononi, the so-called integrated information theory of consciousness. So in the first slide you see the task at hand, namely understanding the origin of consciousness, how it fits into a physical account of the universe and its relation with the body and uh, long-standing questions in philosophy, psychology and brain science. Tall order, but it's part of the materialistic, naturalistic manifesto that we subscribe to that there are no special juices, sources, or forces in the universe that need to be invoked to understand consciousness. So this theory then that we will begin to explain today is a big step in that direction. So it is proposed by Tononi and here is a more recent summary written by both Tononi and Christoph Koch. Uh, you have uh, encountered Christoph Koch on several occasions before in our talks. Now the two of them have teamed up to write this paper in the Royal Society Philosophical Transaction B, Consciousness Here, There and Everywhere. And it's a marvelous paper which is uh, available, of course, uh, in the appendix that goes along with this lecture. So the information uh, theory, integrated information theory, starts not with shining a light or a stimulus into the brain and looking at the reverberations and differentiating those that become aware, enter awareness, and those that don't to find the so-called co correlates of consciousness. Rather, it starts with the phenomenology of consciousness and then tries to determine what kind of structure, what kind of physical structure might be necessary and sufficient to implement consciousness. So consciousness then is what happens when you wake up from a dreamless sleep, when your brain boots up, and it can be all kinds of things. You may be aware of a darkened hotel room. You may be aware of the smell of coffee coming from the kitchen. You may be aware of the alarm clock, or you may be in a drowsy state where you try to remember where you are. All these are states of consciousness. Now, there are some um, definitions, the ph phenomenological axioms uh, called existence, composition, information, and integration. Here's existence. So, experience conscious experience exists intrinsically and can be independent of external observers. So it happens inside your brain. And it has composition. In other words, there are components to this. There is a left side here, there is a right side, here is a hand visible. Uh, the viewpoint is from this person lying down and looking at the window. So there are many aspects to the structure. Color, um, uh, geometry, um, many features are included in this. So the uh, conscious experience is composed of many subsets of different components, composition. It also contains information, meaning that the experience is differentiated. It is not one experience. It is one out of many. You could have had a billion other experiences this moment, but you did not. You had this particular one. So it differs in its particular way from all other experience you could have possibly had. So that is an information content. When you reduce uncertainty of a data set or of the world, that reduction in uncertainty is also called information. So here it's a differentiated experience that by definition then is a set of information. It is also integrated. It is one. It cannot be divided into the left side or the right side unless of course 
you are a split brain person in whom the corpus callosum has been cut for the treatment of epilepsy. So it's unitary. The colors, the shapes, the sounds, the smells, all the qualia, all the components that uh, form the subjective experience are integrated into one whole and it cannot be reduced to non-interdependent components. And there is a principle of exclusion. It is unique. It is only one in content and in the temporal spatial grain in which it takes place. It is not a superposition of multiple experiences with less or more content flowing faster or slower in speed at once. It is what it is for itself, by itself, unique and only one out of a infinite possible, infinite possible set of other experiences that could have happened to you at the same time. All right, so now we start with these axioms and break them down and condense them into postulates according to Tononi. So the first axiom is the existence, essential property of everyday experience, intrinsic existence. So to account for existence, we need a mechanism. A mechanism must uh, exist intrinsically. It must have cause and effect power. Meaning, it is able to influence or be influenced from its own past and its possible futures, the potential different states it may enter in the future. So there are connections from the past states of the system to current and future states that the system, by the way it is constructed, can causally influence itself and its trajectory. So it must have cause and effect power upon itself its present mechanisms and state, it must make a difference to itself, to the probability of some past and future state of the system. And this is then called the so-called cause and effect space. And here you have a drawing. So this is a simple wiring diagram of and or uh, X and on states of a system of three components that may either be in this particular state where a switch is off or on and it is not connected to component D for example so it is not part of the system but it may be connected to component B and E here. So there is a certain wiring diagram that takes place that allows the system to be efficacious in affecting its future states. So here is a more elaborate version of this. Here is composition. You can see here that there is a blue book, there is a left and right side. So consciousness is structured. Each experience is composed of phenomenological distinctions, elementary or higher order, which exist within it. Now to have a mechanism to implement this the system must be structured. Subset of the system elements can occur in various combinations which have again cause and effect powers upon the system itself. Finally we go to information. So consciousness is specific. Each experience is the particular way it is. It is composed of a specific set of specific phenomenological distinctions, thereby differing from all other possible experiences. Differentiation. Now, the system then must specify a cause and effect structure that is the particular way it is. A specific set of cause-effect repertory, thereby differing in, its, differing in its specific way from other possible structures. And here again is our little wiring diagram, and you can see different pathways go to different outcomes in terms of um, cause repertory and effect repertory. Now, in the next slide, 
we look at integration. If you can cut the system at any level without losing um, any information, then the system really didn't exist as such a system. Only if a cut leads to a deterioration of the content of the experience um, is the system an integrated system. So consciousness is unified and the experience is irreducible. The cause-effect structure by the system must be unified. It must be intrinsically irreducible, such that uh, it's specified by a non-interdependent subsystem across its weakest unidirectional link. So there is a so-called minimum information partition that can be applied. Now this is a mouthful. Basically what it says is if you have a piece of a wiring diagram that you can cut without losing the uh, feature of integration, then this cut-off piece never really was part of that particular system anyway. So any cut that deteriorates, impairs the integration of the system, in fact belongs intrinsically to the system. Finally, exclusion. So consciousness is definite in content and spatio-temporal grain, meaning it is no less and no more. It flows in that particular time and at no other time. So again, there is a cause and effect structure that is specified by the system and it must be specified over a single set of elements, not less and not more. So the specificity is also determined by the cause and effect structure that is maximally irreducible, uh, generating a certain number called phi. And phi is a measure then down the road of the information content of this system. So there is a conceptual structure that emerges from the wiring diagram which allows for different cause repertoires to result in certain effect repertoires depending on which of these um, switches were on or off at a particular time. So this then is called a complex and you can calculate a phi which should be a number greater than 1. If the number is 1 you, uh, or, or less than 1 you have very little phi. The higher the number goes the more integrated information is packed into the system by virtue of its intrinsic arrangement and by virtue of its power to affect itself, to make a difference for itself. So that is the theory. So any structure implementing consciousness, the theory states, must satisfy these axioms and postulates. So let's dig a little deeper. So here we have now a physical substrate of a conscious experience, the simplest that you can possibly imagine. Namely, um, it's four logic gates, labeled A, B, C, and D. Right here. Where A is a majority gate, right here. B is an OR gate. And C and D are AND gates. So these are terms from electronics that are utilized here to characterize such a system. So the straight arrow indicates connections among the logic gates. Right here and here. The curved arrow indicates self-connections are shown in a particular state on and off. So here's a curved arrow, for example. The analysis of this system performed according to the postulates of IIT, identifies a conceptual structure, which includes elements A, B, and C, but exclude element D, as indicated by the green circle. So only the structure within the green circle is included as a conceptual structure. So such a complex would be then a candidate for a physical substrate of consciousness. Now stay with me, this will become clearer. So here then we have histograms of 
probability of states that might result from these different gates and how they are turned on or off. And you can see that different mechanisms result in different results here in the outcome of the firing pattern. So there are eight possible states and eight possible future states. So you wind up with a probability matrix which rapidly, of course, um, yields a great number of possibility in the future, uh, yielding a very, very high dimensional space in which these calculations need to take place. So here is the experience and here is a conceptual structure which can be described by uh, assuming such a gate. In this case, as 16 dimensional cause and effect space of the complex which is presented as a circle. So there are eight possible uh, future states um, and of the complex and the position along the axis represents the probability of each state. So the fundamental identity that is postulated by the theory claims that the set of concepts and their relations that composes the conceptual structure are identical to the quality, the qualia of the experience. So this is an identity theory. It says, if these conditions are implemented, then a certain quality of experience is present. Okay. So the fundamental identity, again, postulates by IT, that the set of concepts and their relations that compose the conceptual structure are identical in the, to the quality of the experience. So there's no additional step, there's no translation. There's no, how do we squeeze consciousness out of a wiring pattern such as this? No. If these conditions are implemented in this particular way, the theory says that is the qualia of consciousness. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's done. It's complete identity. So the central identity then is that experience is a conceptual structure which can be implemented in a physical way in these different wiring diagrams that I have shown you before. So experience is identical to a conceptual structure that is maximally irreducible intrinsically. It's wired together, put together in such a way that you cannot take anything out or substitute anything without um, terminally affecting the quality of the experience that this structure presents. So a conceptual structure completely specifies both the quantity and the quality of the experience. How much the system exists, the quantity and level of consciousness is measured by its phi value. So undergirding this entire theory is a set of mathematics which we will not get into today. It's very complex. It deals with multi, uh, multi-dimensional spaces and probabilities that we cannot address here in this lecture. However, the conceptual structure, which way it exists, is the quality and content of consciousness is specified by the shape of this particular multi-dimensional space. So underlying consciousness, well, I should correct myself, consciousness is a higher order, high level, multidimensional mathematical structure or can be expressed as a multidimensional mathematical structure implemented or instantiated or incorporated or made physical by a physical implementation such as neuronal networks in the brain. But again, the important point is there is complete identity. There's no additional step of translation that is required. Here again is some more of the same mathematics. We will uh, switch over to this. And here again is a presentation of how the past states of the structure and the future states 
evolve in a continuum. So the quality of the experience, of course, can change over time. So now, how does this fit in with some findings that have been made on the so-called neural correlates of consciousness? And here is an important paper by Tononi, which appeared in Nature Reviews of Neuroscience. So let's dig into this. Uh, and here's a proposal how perhaps these structures can be built in a neuronal setting. So here we have some macro elements of space, time, and state. We have a set of neurons that either fire at a high firing rate or a neurons, neurons that fire in a burst or maybe in a single spike. So these are three different states that can be differentiated. So the um, PSC uh, can be identified by searching for maxima of the intrinsic cause-effect power as indicated by the theory. Now, in this case, we are looking for groups of neurons or time scales over, let's say, 100 milliseconds or so that are in three states, low, high, and burst firing. Let's see what we can do with this as we assemble this into a higher order. So here we have then in a healthy awake participant a set of neural elements specifying a conceptual structure with the highest phi max assumed based on current evidence to be a complex of neuronal groups distributed over the cortex, the posterior cortex, and maybe some portion of the anterior cortex. So empirical studies should, in principle, be able to establish whether the full neural correlates of consciousness correspond to a maximum of intrinsic cause and effect power, therefore corroborating or falsifying key elements of the integrated information theory. So what happens if we have a problem, a cortical lesion, which can cause absolute achromatopsia, for example, resulting in a smaller complex? So here is your major complex. Here is a shrinking of the major complex, which then should reduce the qualia, the quality of the experience, because things are now reduced in their connectivity and complexity. We may have a disconnection of the brain from input from the environment. So there is no um, sensory input and pure thought prevails. And so the major complex may migrate to a more anterior uh, area to deal with that state of consciousness which is more bound up in thought rather than perception. So we also could have a split for example here, an anatomical split of a major complex, such as in the corpus callosum being cut in the bisective brain in patients with epilepsy. And it's been well shown now in many experiments that patients that have experienced the surgery have two consciousnesses, one in the left hemisphere and one in the right. And sometimes there can be conflicts in executing, executing certain actions and commands, there are very intriguing uh, findings going on because only the left hemisphere can produce speech um, and it will misinterpret many cues coming from the environment uh, because the minor complex here cannot talk to the major complex. Uh, this is the split brain phenomenon. We can also have a splitting of a major complex which is more functional. In fact, allocating certain activities to, let's say, daydreaming, whereas perception is continuing still in the posterior cortex. And we may have the coexistence of complexes at the same time. So here is an um, experience of a certain uh, stimulus that uh, allows for the focus of attention on only certain um, letters being detected in linkage to an auditory stimulus. And of course, these are picked out by the attentional process. However, it can be shown that the total conceptual structure is still present in the background, uh, supporting the theory. So here we have the small assemblies dealing with 
the task here of the uh, experience of uh, detecting certain letters in conjunction with an auditory stimulus. And here we have Broca's area, which is able to report, of course, whether a stimulus has been perceived or not. However, you can show that the total complexity of the surroundings are still present in the conceptual structure in the rest of the brain, as indicated by this total blob here. Now, this is in stark contrast, this theory is in stark contrast to the um, theory of the, um, the network, um, the, the uh, workspace network, the total workspace network that has been proposed in other theories, namely that you need ignition. After a stimulus or comes in, for example, auditory or visual to the appropriate cortex, you need a rapid broadcasting or propagation uh, to frontal areas to yield the stimulus to become consciously aware. In previous talks on consciousness, we have debated this and have decided that there are non-report paradigms of conscious perception which basically say that the broadcasting of this network is not really required and uh, the integrated information theory does not imply that frontal cortices need to be involved. Rather, it seems to be specialized in the hot zone of the posterior cortex for perception. But of course, frontal cortices are also part of the experience and the assemblies that it postulates. The different complexes being formed may uh, unify all kinds of cortical areas and are not uh, distinct um, as they are here in the unified uh, network theory. So in IT, you have the detection of a conceptual structure which is triggered not by propagation to frontal areas, but rather the conceptual structures is triggered as a whole by the bursting pattern that uh, forms the conceptual structure that corresponds to, quote-unquote, a face. So the prefrontal neurons may provide top-down facilitation of a pathway between face neurons and, and the fusiform face area and neurons in Broca's area, allowing you to respond to the report. Here's Broca's area and say, oh no, I did not see the face. But it's not required for detection. Detection happens as a change in the cause and effect structure in the cortex as a whole. Okay, now, the key element of all of this rigmarole is the statement that the structures invoked, the mathematics that correspond to these structures, form an identity, that conscious experience is the structure, is the, the complex that is produced by these wiring patterns by these relationships in the brain. No additional translation is necessary. Now there are other theories that also are of the identity kind and they have been stunningly successful. So I want to illustrate this to you. Here is uh, Einstein of course and uh, he is writing on the blackboard the curvature tensor equation that is part of the general theory of relativity. Now the general the of theory of relativity makes astounding statements. The theory says there is no force from the earth to the moon, no gravity force like a spring for example, a, a stretch spring that keeps the moon in orbit. There's no force at all. Instead, what there is, is a distortion of space produced by mass. So any mass in space will impact space, not only space, but space-time, really. And it will curve the space-time in some kind of proportion to the mass present. And this is described by 
uh, GAB here. So this is the famous tensor that Einstein used to describe the warping of space-time by heavy objects within space. So mass tells space how to warp and the warp space tells objects how to move. So here then you have a heavy objects and you can see there is a warping going on of space-time and any object that is going this path will be deflected according to the mass present. So this then is the famous equation uh, of Einstein's general relativity. It looks so simple, but once you start unpacking it, it sprouts into pages and pages and pages of additional equations that are all packed together in this simple equation here. So this is, of course, the, the, the tensor that we talked about before. Now, there is identity here. The theory does not say there's anything else going on. It says that mass will warp space. Mass and warp space are part of the same system. There's no additional translation. It is what it is. So Tononi would say it's intrinsically itself. It cannot be reduced. It just is what it is. Now, Einstein was struck by the beauty of this theory and was quite convinced for it to be true, but of course it had to be subjected to experiment, and it was. It was shown during a solar eclipse that you can detect a deviation of the path of a star of starlight from a certain star uh, deviated from its original path by the mass of the sun. The sun curving space in such a way that the image of the star would be displaced by a certain amount which Einstein predicted and which the astronomers verified exactly. Now it turns out that Einstein's equation had a hidden surprise, and that is a solution. One solution of Einstein's equation suggests that there is a singularity where the gravity, the distortion of space-time, becomes so strong that no object, not even light, can escape. We can't even conceptualize what the inside of this thing looks like, and eventually it was called a black hole. Einstein had trouble believing this. He vacillated back and forth for quite some time. Um, there's something about mathematics that is so powerful that you like the beauty of the equations, but when you analyze what the result, what the predictions are of the equation, people begin to back off. And Einstein has backed off several times of his own equations. Uh, he was worried about the black hole. Uh, of course, now we know that every galaxy that we have ever studied contains a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. So again, there is no additional secret, so secret sauce. Mass, big masses, will modulate, will distort space and time in such a way that these phenomena are happening. So why do I bother with this? Well, the reason is to highlight the idea of identity. You can have a theory that poses an identity, such as phi or the integrated information theory posing identity of its postulates and uh, axioms with the qualia of experience. Nothing else is required. So then the task is to subject this experience to experimental proof, to 
bombard it with experiments and try to falsify it, just like it has been done and continues to be done for Einstein's theory of relativity. In the end, if no experiments ever contradicts the theory, then you are left with the notion that you need to accept the theory as it is, because it is what it is. So here are some of the experiments that have been done to test Einstein's theory of relativity. We will not go into this in great detail, just to tell you that it has been rigorously examined and has not failed a single test up to this time. So very quickly, some tests of the integrated information theory of consciousness. So here is a, a theory, a test of consciousness, an index, a theoretical index of consciousness, which uses combined transmagnetic stimulation and the processing of EEG. So you put a transmagnetic pulse into the cortex and you see the reverberation of the electrical activity throughout the brain and here you see the migration over the cortex to different brain regions as the milliseconds clock by. Now you can look at the complexity of the signals of the perturbation, the perturbation complexity index that have been produced by the injection of this um, um, impulse and you can subject these signals to what's called a compression algorithm. You can compress complex functions by reducing their complexity with certain algorithms and you can normalize it and then you come up with a number. So this particular algorithm is the Lempel-Ziff com com complexion algorithm which is used for example in um, uh, visual uh, image uh, compression and another compression task as well. So as you do this, you can now show that if you uh, are in non-REM sleep, in deep sleep, you don't get the progression that you normally see here and the complexity index increases. Here you see a test of various conditions. Non-REM sleep Midazolam induced sedation, xenon um, induced uh, anesthesia, and propofol reduced anesthesia. And here you see the different stimuli at the different intensity plotted in awake subjects. This is the number you should get around a 0 0.5 for complexity index. And as you can see, and as predicted by the theory, under conditions where consciousness is reduced, the complexity index goes way down. And that's true for all the different, here's midazolam, here's xenon, and here's the re-emergence after you withdraw the agent into the normal range that you would expect. So here is the normal number of PCI, um, the complexity index, and here are the different conditions, non-REM sleep. Your consciousness is gone you might as well de be dead to the world. There's no consciousness in deep sleep. Here is midazolam, also known as Verset. Here is xenon anesthesia, and here is propofol. So yes, the uh, perturbation complexity index then would be one uh, measure that is consistent with the prediction made by the complexity, by the information theory of consciousness because com the integration of complexity is part of that theory. And if you reduce the complexity, then consciousness should vanish. Here are different patients, um, patients with um, different levels of consciousness, um, re reduction of consciousness. Here is vegetative state and you can see that the PCA, the, the perturbation complexity index, is decreased in these patients. But there are other patients that appear to be non-conscious. However, the um, objective measurement of consciousness with the PCI indicates that consciousness, in fact, is present in some of these patients. So here is propofol anesthesia, and you can uh, make a linear correlation between the depth of the anesthesia 
and the dissociation, the disaggregation of cortical connectivity, which is uh, picked up by the perturbation complexity index. So here is wakefulness, here is intermediate state anesthesia, here is deep anesthesia. And contrast that with non-REM sleep, you get a similar phenomenon. So, so far the theory is confirmed in a sense by these experiments. Now, you may object. What about injecting a transmagnetic, a, a transcranial pulse into the brain? Maybe there are other disturbances created by this. It's an artificial thing. It's not a natural phenomenon. So this group here, associated with Anil Seth, a major researcher in the field, has looked at the complexity of spontaneous EEG by using a number of statistical measures during propofol uh, uh, anesthesia and looked at the complexity of multidimensional spontaneous EEG and just briefly they show the same result, namely that wakefulness and rest here have high indica indicators of complexity, mild sedation has decreased complexity and propofol or loss of consciousness is down here. So again, even if you don't use perturbation complexity, the natural spontaneous complexity that you can um, recover from normal EEG signals also would indicate that there's a correlation between complexity and consciousness. So again here is another paper comparing propofol xenon and ketamine anesthesia and you can see here that the transmagnetic stimulus evokes different waveforms in these different conditions. And again, as before, you can see that here under C, which is uh, propofol B, you get a shutdown in the complexity. Propofol will shut down consciousness. However, ketamine is of a different sort. And it's well known that ketamine is a different anesthetic. It's a dissociative agent that doesn't abolish consciousness as such, but allows you to, or disallows you in a sense, to have access to your conscious experience as to what's going on during anesthesia. So then that is the summary. These were three brief tests for this theory. There are others, and we will have another expansion on this talk on the integrated information theory. So let's um, go over this very quickly again. We start with the phenomenon of consciousness. We have axioms. Consciousness is integrated, it's holistic, it, uh, it is what it is for itself, and we need a structure which has causal efficacy for itself and in itself in order to implement such consciousness. We can then postulate some wiring diagrams which may physically be able to implement such a structure. And we know that if we take a cut through these structures and the cut does not alter the level of integration of consciousness, then the element that has been cut away was never really in existence as part of the implementing structure. So then we make the great leap, which is to postulate identity. Identity of the phenomenon of consciousness with that which is implemented by this structure. And we uh, contrast this with another theory of identity, namely Einstein's general relativity, which shows an identity between mass and its effect on space-time without any other intermediaries. It is what it is. If mass is there, then this is what is. So Tononi would say if phi, if the number phi has a certain value, then you have a certain level of consciousness. It is what it is without any additional intermediate forces. So that's our preliminary conclusion of our series on consciousness. We will need to come back and amplify and give you more details on this, but this gives you a flavor of the current state of the art of our thinking on consciousness and how science can approach it without evoking any spooky forces or secret sources, but rather have it all flow naturally from our physicality.
Thanks for your attention and we'll see you soon again for another talk at Behavioral Health 2000.